Good afternoon and welcome to Lower Intermediate English Conversation. Professor Kent Lee again. Last time we talked about English Korean expressions and in case you didn't catch all of them or want um, those in writing, I will uh, put a link in the LMS on the announcement page to a page on my website that uh, lists and explains those terms that we talked about last time. Today we're going to talk about British and American English expressions. So British English, uh, also sometimes called Commonwealth England, uh, the United Kingdom used to have, well, still does, but used to have kind of an empire. Um, and as those nations became independent, they still remained in sort of an economic political association with England called the Commonwealth. So we can also use the term Commonwealth English, and that especially refers to um, the English uh, spoken in England, Ireland, Northern Ireland, um, Australia, New Zealand, maybe to some degree Canada, but especially British, Australian, New Zealand, English, uh, we call these Commonwealth English. So the expressions we're going, we are going to talk about today are British, and also many of them are general Commonwealth English expressions. They're kind of universal to uh, British-influenced varieties of English, uh, like those of Ireland, New Zealand, and Australia, to lesser degree, maybe Canada. So you have a handout provided in the LMS, and um, there are three sections, and um, there's the first section with just some simple uh, words, vocabulary items. We don't say vocabularies, we say vocabulary items or words in English. Um, and then a couple of sections with um, some sentences, expressions. Uh, so it's important to know these differences because one, you could make mistakes and you don't want to cause misunderstandings, especially when you're traveling or if you're talking to um, people from those countries when they are visiting your country. Um, so this will help you to avoid maybe little mistakes uh, with English because there's some words that mean different things or just aren't commonly used between American versus Commonwealth English. Another reason is, of course, um, British or Commonwealth English is just as important as American English. Um, in Korean East Asian schools, unfortunately, the education system puts too, much, puts too much emphasis on American English. And while I'm an American, um, they would think, oh, I'm, I like that, but no, because um, American English is not the only kind. There's no one correct kind of English. Um, American, Canadian, um, Standard British, Australian, New Zealand, um, those are all valid varieties or uh, types of English. And American English is not the only important kind of English in the world. Um, a lot of people uh, from Europe uh, have studied British English in their schools, uh, or they studied maybe both uh, British and American in their schools and their education systems. And they will use maybe more likely British terms, uh, you know, like I live in a flat, uh, I have a nice new flat, meaning apartment, things like that. Um, people from Middle East, African countries, pretty much people from much of the world, Hong Kong, Singapore, um, India. They have studied British English, or their English is influenced by British English, and it's important to know those terms. Um, TV shows. Britain produces a lot of really good TV shows, and I have been watching British TV shows as an American ever since I was in middle school. I first got hooked on British comedies and Doctor Who when I was young, and I still like Doctor Who. I still watch Doctor Who, and when I can, when I have time, other British uh, comedies and also dramas. There's some good uh, crime dramas out of England too. Uh, so British is important. Commonwealth English is important in the world. Uh, you should not just learn American English. And in fact, uh, that might give some Koreans a bad impression that English, learning English is about um, and tied to American imperialism uh, when it shouldn't be um, perceived that way. Uh, English is a world language. It's um, the the language of 
um, a good part of the world for international business and science and communication. And it's not just American. Um, it belongs to the British, the Australians, it belongs to India, it belongs to Singapore, Hong Kong, South Africa, uh, much of the world. Uh, so there's no one type of English that's correct or standard. So you should be familiar with these uh, kinds of expressions so that you can appreciate Doctor Who and British comedies and British crime dramas. And when you, in, if you work for a company or you go to, you know, academic conferences and you talk to people from other countries, it will help to know these British terms and maybe later if you can get used to British pronunciation, that's helpful too. So, on the handout, first section, British terms. Some of these words uh, are uniquely British, some have different meanings between British and American. So I want you to pause the video first and look at the first section of just words, or about two dozen words there. Um, discuss these words with somebody. What do you think they mean? How are they different between British and American? So pause the video and talk about it. And we're back and I'm going to sit at my desk so I can look at my handout on my computer. So, anti-clockwise. Usually a clock goes clockwise, the reverse direction. In American English is counterclockwise, and in British it's anti-clockwise. Anti-clockwise. Number two, barrister. If you have, a, uh, you have to go to court, you need to hire a lawyer, the kind of lawyer that you hire. Uh, for a court case in the British English is called a barrister. I need to see a barrister. I need to sue somebody. Biscuit and cookie. Okay, these are a little different. Um, you know, cookie, typical kind of snack food, a sweet snack food. We call it in American English a cookie. But in British, that's typically called a biscuit. We're going to have biscuits for dessert. A biscuit. In American English, we do say biscuit, but it has a different meaning. Uh, it's sort of like maybe a bread roll, but it's thicker. It's uh, not a soft bread, but it's usually something thicker, heavier, um, maybe a little thinner. And it's eaten not as a snack. It's not sweet. It's eaten with a meal. Um, you can have breakfast biscuits. You can have dinner biscuits. Um, you might cut it open and put butter in it like a bread roll, but it's a slightly different kind of material, a biscuit. Blimey! This is a kind of a British expression like, gosh, or wow, or oh no, or darn, right? Blimey, that was going fast. Or blimey, that was, blimey, I forgot something. Or blimey, that was a good movie. Uh, it's kind of a cute expression. Uh, the origin, by the way, it's contraction hundreds of years ago of May God Blind Me. Again, it used to be a religious culture. May God Blind Me got contracted to blind me. Like, gosh, wow. And now, a stronger expression in British is bloody or bleeding. Um, and it's maybe more like damn or damn it. Of course, they say that too. But um, it used to be considered a lot more rude than it is today. But it's still kind of strong. It's strong, kind of like damn or damn it. I was a bloody stupid test. Or, oh, he's, he's a bleeding idiot. Oh, he's a bleeding idiot. He's stupid, isn't he? Okay. Or, bloody, I forgot something. I've got to go back. Okay. Bloody is kind of an explanation. Bleeding is more like an adjective. Like, he's bleeding. He's a bleeding idiot. Or, bloody is more like an, can be an adverb. He's bloody stupid. British people used to treat this as kind of a curse word, like a word you shouldn't say. And the, the part, it was partly because they kind of misunderstood the origin. Um, because there's a different, there's a, another kind of curse word that sounds similar, but it's, it has a different origin. If you read Shakespeare, Shakespeare, of course, wrote for the common person, the masses, and he threw in sometimes some, some curses, which you don't recognize today as curses. And so sometimes you see in Shakespeare, splud, or um, means uh, 
by the blood. Uh, it's a contracted form of by the blood or something blood referring to the blood of Christ. So it's swearing on the blood of Christ. So it was kind of a religious kind of curse or oath. Um, and of course, the average people in Shakespeare's audience, they liked that, but religious people were, off were, were offended by the kind of term. So maybe um, older conservative British people kind of thought bloody and bleeding were related to that religious curse, that expression. Um, um, religious curse, because it's kind of like offensive, kind of like saying God damn or something like that, and religious people don't like that. Um, but actually, bloody and bleeding are not related to the religious curse, or the religious oath. But a lot of British people, older British people, thought it was, and so they would kind of really, really react against it. And so it was not a, a word you would say in public, you know, a few decades ago, but I think th things have changed and they realize it's not related to that religious curse. And it's become more common. Uh, and I say it sometimes because of all the British shows I watch, bloody, it's like, oh, I'm really saying damn it. Okay. Next one, bonnet. A bonnet of a car. Uh, so Americans say hood, the front part of the car you lift open to look at the engine or check the oil. That's the car hood, or the British say bonnet, car bonnet. And car park. We say in American English a parking lot, an open space where you park cars, parking lot. And they say car park, car park. They delete, they often kind of drop R's in British. Cheeky, that's a nice, very informal word. Don't be cheeky with me, young lady. Uh, when uh, uh, for example, a teenage child is, is acting disrespectful, rude, or being sarcastic, but in a rude or disrespectful way. That's cheeky. Maybe Americans would say insolent or sassy. Don't act sassy with me, young lady. Or don't act cheeky with me, young lady. I told you to be home by 10 o'clock. Okay, cheeky. Uh, chips and crisps. So Americans eat French fries with their burgers. Uh, British eat fish and chips, and they're kind of the same thing. Maybe they're cut a little bit more like kind of wedge shapes in Britain, but it's kind of like French fries. They call it chips, fish and chips. They're like potato fries. And then for potato chips, what we eat for a snack while watching you know, the sports game, they eat crisps, British eat they call them crisps, potato crisps, while you're watching your football game. And again, football is the uh, European term for what we call soccer, not American football. Clever. I have noticed an interesting kind of difference in nuance between these two words from watching British TV shows for years. In British, it's kind of a general term. You would generally, you would describe someone in general as clever, meaning smart, sharp, intelligent. Um, oh, he's a clever young boy, isn't he? He's really good at math. He loves that math. He's really clever. He can solve anything in math. Ask him any thing and he'll solve it for you. Uh, so you would describe a person in general as clever in British. But in American English, it's a little different. Um, it refers to maybe showing skill or intelligence in a particular task. Oh, that was clever. You fixed, you f American. Oh, that was clever. You fixed that. You fixed that for your mommy. I would say to my son, oh, that was clever. You fixed that for your mommy. You fixed that by yourself. Wow, that was clever. So I'm referring to something that he did, a particular instance. Um, um, something he did that shows intelligence or skill. Oh, that was clever. Um, but in British, it's a general description of a person, meaning smart. Dim, the opposite, kind of dumb. Well, he's kind of dim, isn't he? Yes. How did he become prime minister? He's so dim. Okay. Hamper. Um, it's a basket, but in American English, it's a basket, basket for your dirty laundry, your dirty clothes, a clothes hamper. And in British, it's a food basket, like if you're going on a picnic. Oh. Put some bread in the hamper and bring it for a picnic. It's a food basket. 
And an American would think, what? Bring a hamper for the picnic, what? Yeah. And a little different in how you use it. Uh, holiday. So Americans talk about going on vacation, uh, often, uh, uh, we're going on vacation or we're taking a vacation to Thailand uh, or to New Zealand. British say holiday, and generally in Europe they talk about going on holiday. Oh, we're going on holiday for the summer, we're going um, over to, to uh, Iceland for holiday, we're going to Canada for holiday. A lift, you may have noticed this, Americans say elevator, British say lift. Uh, for that machine that takes you up to different floors. Lorry is a transport truck for uh, freight, uh, cargo, huamul, and it's kind of different. Uh, so in the U.S. we have these huge, huge trucks for carrying freight. If a company wants to, you know, send a lot of stuff, like its factory to the stores. It's loaded on a big, huge truck. It's a huge truck. It's got 18 wheels, literally 18 wheels. And that's a common kind of transport truck um, that's used in the States. And you might think that's like a size of a shipping container. And <clears throat> it sometimes it is. Um, it can be just a um, regular truck where that storage part is permanent. Or it could be an actual shipping container. They might take it off a ship at the port in Los Angeles uh, and put it on one of those trucks and the truck just dries off with it. So those huge trucks are standard in uh, North America. But in Britain, they don't have, uh, in general in Europe, they don't use huge, huge trucks like that. They have what's called a lorry, which is, um, well, it's smaller than an American 18-wheeler truck, definitely. Uh, Maybe it's got six wheels, I guess. I don't know. So it's, think of a Korean bongo truck, but it's kind of longer. It's longer than a bongo truck. Um, and that's what they typically use for transporting materials and, and goods uh, between places. And so a lorry driver is a truck driver. Lorry driver. Mate, here, oh, here's one that could cause confusion. So in American English, it's primarily like a your marriage partner, your mate, uh, or two animals, their mates, you know, the male and female bird, they've been mates for a long time. Um, mates says for purposes of permanent marriage, having children and such. But in Commonwealth English, it's different. Uh, it's your friend, your buddy. Uh, I'm going out with my mates for dinner. We can include female friends too. Um, Oh, she, she's just a mate. <laughs> Sounds different in American English. Like, oh, you want to marry her? You want to mate with her? No, no, she's just a mate, a friend, a buddy. Um, so your friends that you hang out with, you're your mates, your good friends. Going out with my mates to the football game, soccer game, different. Nappy or napkin? So, <laughs> uh, I don't have a napkin here. Um, it's like your dinner napkin, piece of paper used for wiping your mouth um, in American English. In British English, a napkin or nappy is a diaper, what babies wear, um, baby diaper. Uh, so um, at dinner in British, you would use a serviette. It's a word from French, a serviette to wipe your mouth, a serviette. And don't worry, I'll maybe put all these words on a website, on a page on my website later. Pavement. So, um, in American English, pavement is like just road surfacing, the road cover, like the, the, the road. There's the dirt ground and then there's the pavement, like the street, um, the black street surface, that's pavement. So, the concrete sidewalk or the street, which is black asphalt pavement, that material for covering the ground for cars and for pedestrians, pohing. British pavement is more often the sidewalk where you walk, where pedestrians walk. You get on the pavement. Petrol, you may have noticed this. Americans say gas or gasoline uh, for what you put in your car to make it go. And the British say petrol. Um, by the way, in, I think in Korean you say, uh, often you say oil, kirim, or gas oil, but it's gas or gasoline in American English, petrol in Europe.
in Commonwealth English. Q is like a line. We're queuing up to buy tickets. We're lining up to buy tickets. So Americans say line, I'm standing in line. Uh, I'm lining up and British uh, stand in a queue or we're queuing up to buy tickets. We've been queuing up here for a, for a long time. Quid. So this is a kind of a slang term for a one pound money. Uh, can I borrow a couple of quid? Can I borrow a couple of pounds from you? So uh, a pound, a British money is a quid in slang. Americans say buck, hey, can you loan me five bucks, five dollars? And in Canada, by the way, um, they, a slang term is loony. A loony is, well, in American English, loony is a slang term for crazy, who is really loony. But in Canadian English, um, their dollar coins have a picture of a duck on them. Which I had a picture. Um, it's a type of duck known as a loony. So it's a, loony is the name of a duck in Canadian English. Um, and so their dollar coins are often called loonies in slang. Oh, can you give me five loonies for this? Can you give me a loony? Okay, can you give me a quid? It'll cost five quid. You might even hear, maybe not so necessarily so slangy in British, even in a shop. Oh, that'll, that'll be five quid yeah, for, the, for the meal. Rubber, ooh. This one can cause confusion. In American English, this is called an eraser for erasing marks on your paper. British call it a rubber. <clears throat> Can you pass me a rubber? Be careful in America, don't refer to this as a rubber. People will laugh at you. Why? In American slang, a rubber is a slang term for a condom. Be careful. I know this is kind of like a, some naughty language here, but you need to know this so you don't make mistakes. Call this an eraser in the US, call it a rubber in in the UK or in Commonwealth English. Don't confuse the two. Uh, rubber can also refer to rubber rain boots um, sometimes, or Americans would more often say galoshes, uh, kind of an old word, or rubbers, rubber rain boots, and more so in British, British English. Thick, it's kind of like, oh, he's really thick. He's really stupid. That prime minister, he's so thick. How did he become prime minister? What a thick man. Um, an American would say stupid or also dense. It was really dense, like in the head. Uh, tube. Uh, so, of course, from, um, of course, a lot of things can be called a tube, something that's kind of a cylinder, long cylinder shape. Um, what you use for swimming, we often call an inner tube because it looks like the inner tube of a big tire. Uh, a tube. We would call it an inner tube for swimming. Um, in British, they often use tube for subway. I'm taking the tube. Um, got to go. I've got to go to central London. I'm going to take the tube. Okay, the subway. <clears throat> um, so, uh, one I don't have in here. You probably, hopefully, know this. Flat is British for apartment. Oh, I've got a nice new flat. Want to come visit? Apartment is a flat. And uh, a flatmate is your apartment roommate. Okay, I've got two flatmates. They really love to stay up late and watch movies. I can't really sleep in this flat. Maybe I should get a, move out to another flat. Okay, an apartment. I should put that in there too. All right. Um, next, um, there's the next section of British expressions. So some of these are British, some are American. Try to guess which ones are which, which are British, which are American. And often these have similar meanings. So pause the video and talk about this. Uh, all right, and we're back. First of all, you might notice me slipping into a British accent. That's somewhat deliberate. Um, I have picked up sort of a fake British accent and you might hear me speak especially in class sometimes, slipping into a fake British accent. If I was watching Doctor Who the night before, the next day I might come into class speaking a little bit of a fake British. You can tell it's fake because one, I'm not consistent. Uh, I don't speak a consistent British accent. It will vary. 
because my ears are not really attuned to the different kinds of British accents that there are. It could be posh uh, or a very elegant or posh British accent or BBC English or kind of more Londonish that a common worker in London might uh, like speak, but you know, I can't do them all very well. And then there's Scottish. I might be fake speaking in a fake Scottish sometimes. I might kind of go back and forth between one accent and the other because I'm not, I'm not consistent because I, ever, I never lived there. I've just picked up um, you know, British accents from TV and I might be thinking of a particular Doctor Who actor when I'm speaking one way and then um, think of another British actor and speak a little bit different. I'm not consistent. Um, I would not be able to go there and um, pretend I'm British and people would kind of guess, oh, that's a fake accent. You're an American, aren't you? Okay, so British expressions. Autumn and fall. Americans often say fall, British say autumn. That makes sense. Fall has other meanings too, so it makes sense. Uh, the autumn here is quite lovely. Knackered, oh, I'm knackered. I'm, I've been working so hard, I'm just knackered. It means like really exhausted, really tired. It is knackered, you're really tired, exhausted. Uh, you're really happy. Oh, I'm thrilled in American English. Oh, I'm just so thrilled. I'm or British. Oh, I'm kind of a cute expression in British. Oh, I'm chuffed to bits. I'm just so happy. I'm chuffed to bits. I got a thousand pounds. I got a thousand pound bonus from my company. I'm chuffed to bits. I'm gonna go go celebrate. Okay. Um, okay, four. Okay, mention this. Finding a new flat or apartment. Okay, flat British Commonwealth English. Apartment is American English. All right, number five, entree. So this is from French. It's pronounced entree or entree in French. This is a little confusing. Uh, so in British, in Commonwealth English, uh, it is a small dish served before the main meal, what Americans would call an appetizer. And in American English, entree is like a main meal, a main course. Uh, all of the main entree is coming now. You have an appetizer and then an entree. Or in British, the entree comes first before the main, the main course, the main meal, the main course. Okay. Um, go to the barber, especially, especially guys. Um, when I cut your bangs, so uh, women too. The part of your hair that hangs down over your forehead, these, these are your bangs. I hate bangs. I always comb it back kind of annoying or uncomfortable. So Americans call these bangs. I don't know why. Um, these are your bangs. In British, they call it fringe. Please cut my fringe short. I hate the fringe. It's so annoying. Okay. Uh, seven. Uh, Americans say a laundromat. The British say laundrette. You know, like a coin laundry place. Uh, eight. Can I pet your dog? In American English or British, can I stroke your dog? Yes. Can I stroke your dog to pet it? Number nine. I need to hang my poster. Would you happen to have a spare drawing pin? Not a pen, but a pin. So the British call these, I guess, a drawing pin. Um, Americans call them a thumbtack. A thumbtack for hanging posters. Thumbtack. I never use these. Why do I have these? Uh, and something similar is a push pin or a bulletin board pin. Uh, the British say drawing pin. Uh, ten, a vacuum cleaner. Uh, Americans just say vacuum cleaner. Uh, British say Hoover, which I, I think it's an American company. But oddly, uh, British mainly use Hoover as a common word for a vacuum cleaner. Uh, as a verb too, I'm hoovering the carpet. I've got to hoover the carpet today. Oh, the hoover is broken. Oh, the, oh, there's another hoover in the closet. You can hoover the vacuum. You can hoover the carpet. Vacuum the carpet in American English. It's kind of funny that British say hoover. Uh, so that's an example of a brand, a, a brand name or company name, becoming commonly used. Um, another example, especially in American English. Well, tissue, facial tissue, we call Kleenex, the main company in 
Uh, the OS for this is Kleenex, the Kleenex company. Okay, next, uh, doctor says I have mono, mononucleo mononucleosis in American English, glandular fever in British. Uh, so this is kind of a very common viral infection, um, fever, um, body aches, um, tiredness, fatigue. Um, when I was young, we called it the kissing disease. It was rumored that you can get it from kissing somebody or from drinking fountains or somebody with mono and uh, have been drinking from. Uh, I don't know how common it is. I haven't heard of it anymore. Uh, it used to be fairly somewhat common, mono. I have mono. Oh, the kissing disease. You were kissing somebody. Uh, another name is Pfeiffer's disease or something like that. Anyway, um, number 12, um, in British, do you have a plaster? I cut my finger, do you have a plaster? So Americans will say a bandage, or sometimes a brand name, Band-Aid. See here on my finger, see how dedicated I am as a teacher? I cut my finger just so I could do this video for you. Okay, no, not really. Uh, so this is a bandage, or a Band-Aid. Band-Aid is more of a, I think, a brand name. Um, British say plaster. I also need a washcloth, or British say flannel. A washcloth, um, I think is not common, um, maybe outside of American and British culture, or Commonwealth culture and American culture. It's a small piece of cloth, it's about maybe, you know, 10 or 20 centimeters square. <clears throat> and uh, if I'm shaving, of course, typically in the US, it's still fairly common to use a blade razor not an electric razor, and for that you need a washcloth to wash your face after shaving, guys anyway. Uh, this is not common I think in Europe or in Asia. Um, Brit we call it a washcloth, the British call it a flannel. You can also use it for, I guess, for cleaning your cut, I guess. Um, now in American English, flannel is more often a material like for a shirt. I don't have it with me, but kind of a um, Material with it is kind of a thick cotton material and has kind of kind of sort of dark colored stripes or lighter dark colored stripes or neutral colors <coughs> and it's kind of very warm and comfortable in the winter a flannel shirt um, so I think for Americans flannel more often refers to that kind of clothing a flannel shirt material type of cotton material um, tea towel for dishes or a dish towel in American English or kitchen towel in American English. Uh, British say a tea towel. Um, okay, 14 we talked about biscuits. Um, British would say biscuits for the snack kind. Americans say cookies in the cupboard or cabinet. So you know, in the kitchen we open the doors, you keep your dishes and your snacks. That's a cabinet. Um, British still say cupboard, cupboard or shortened to cupboard in pronunciation, cupboard. <coughs> a flashlight in American English is a torch in British. Okay, maybe a torch, turn on the torch. It's in the car trunk, or Americans would say a car trunk in the back of the car, where maybe you keep car tools and boxes and, and for your groceries from shopping. British call that a boot. Oh, do you get a torch from the boot, the car boot? Get a flashlight from the trunk. <clears throat> you're getting on my nerves. It's Americans. You're getting on my nerves. Stop emailing me all the time. Or British. You're getting on my goat. Yeah, well, <laughs> definitely doesn't sound American. You're getting on my goat. Stop bothering me. Stop phoning me all the time. Okay. We're just having a chin wag. British for kind of a chat, talk, chatting, gossiping. Americans, a little chat. Uh, 18. Oh, this is interesting. Um, so, pissed. In, uh, especially in American English, it's a bad word. Um, so, you probably know to piss is a bad word, meaning uh, kind of a vulgar or very colloquial word, meaning to urinate. Uh, but also means angry. So, in American English, I'm pissed means it's kind of a not polite expression it means I'm really angry, I'm pissed. You wouldn't say it to your, in a formal setting. Say, I'm really pissed at the boss. 
I'm really pissed at the boss. He's making me come in to work on Saturday. Now, in Commonwealth English, British, Australian, pretty much in much of the English-speaking world, often pissed means drunk. Oh, he went to the pub and he got, Americans say bar, British say pub. He went to the bar and got totally pissed last night. He came into work pissed this morning. <clears throat> He's totally pissed. He's totally drunk. Really, really drunk. 19, having a smoke, a cigarette, uh, a cig, maybe sometimes in American slang. Um, be careful with this. In, now, in British, they say fag as a slang term sometimes for a cigarette. Don't say fag in American English. It does not mean that in American English. They won't understand that it means cigarette. Um, it's not common anymore, but in American English, fag used to be, or faggot, was an insult, a negative term for a gay person. And it's definitely not nice to say this <laughs> anymore. Well, it was never nice to say it um, to insult gay people. Um, this is wrong, and, and of course, some Americans might be offended. Oh, I'm having a fag. What? Mm, insulting gay person? What? No, there's a cigarette in British. Uh, slang term. Uh, <clears throat> That's so daft. It's stupid in British. Oh, he's really daft. He's really, or, or that. That's so daft, isn't it? So isn't it in kind of British dialects, uh, regional dialects and kind of working class dialects, it gets contracted to in it. That's, that's daft, isn't it? Oh, that's daft, isn't it? So, and I do hear these expressions in British when I watch British TV shows um, regularly. Uh, especially in recent years, I really notice in it. I think it's becoming more common now in British English, in it. So daft, in it. All right. Uh, next section, there's some more British expressions. And um, again, these may or may not have uh, be recognized by Americans. Might be different. So pause the video and discuss these for minutes. What do you think these British expressions mean? Uh, what are American equivalents? Let's so pause the video and talk about this for a while. All right, and we're back. More of my fake British pronunciation here. Uh, you can tell it's really inconsistent. All right, fancy a cuppa. So fancy in British means uh, desire or wish. It can be a noun or a verb. Would you fancy a cup of coffee? Yeah, so fancy, would you like? Uh, oh, I would really fancy that. Or whatever suits your fancy, whatever your, your desire, your wish. Oh, okay. I would, so commonly they would say, I would like, somebody would, li would like, oh, we'd really fancy a nice chocolate ice cream right now, or I could really fancy some spicy chicken right now. So a cuppa is short for a cup of coffee, a cuppa, a cup of coffee. Now some Americans might know this expression, cuppa. Um, a fancy, the British verb, definitely very British. All right. So in American English, it's, I'm okay, I'm all right. Now, if you ask it as a question in American English, it's more like, are you okay? Are you all right? And like, oh, she fell down. Are you all right? Are you okay? Are you hurt? But in British, in colloquial or very informal British, uh, it is kind of like, how are you? Say, all right? Like, hi, how are you? All right? That's kind of interesting. Cheers is kind of a cute, uh, semi-formal expression meaning goodbye. Um, you might notice I signed my emails with cheers and being fake British. Uh, but I just think it's a very convenient uh, way of signing email. Cheers. That's kind of a British way of saying goodbye. Uh, kind of informal. It's an informal or semi-formal goodbye. So I might say to my... Uh, at a, previous job, I had an office mate from Australia, um, you know, and I had lunch maybe with um, friends from, you know, the UK or, or, or South Africa, so saying goodbye, we say cheers, this is goodbye. <coughs> Four, um, I just bodged it. So bodged in British uh, has two meanings as a verb 
it can be a mistake. Oh, I really bodged that exam. I really I messed up on that exam. I bodged it. Uh, another expression is if you kind of fix something in a way that's really temporary. It's not very skillful, but it's just temporary, um, kind of jerry-rigged in American English. Uh, I just botched it. I, uh, the shelf, I didn't have uh, anything proper to fix the shelf, so I just used a nail and I botched it. Um, just a temporary fixed job. Um, uh, and in five, that's particularly meaning in number five, that was the right bodge job. So right is like really, that was the right bodge job, like a really poor repair job. Uh, so um, he, he came and fixed my, my bookshelf, but it was a right bodge job. It's really a poor, a bad quality, or very temporary repair job. Uh, six, rubbish. So they say rubbish often for trash, and often you're like, oh, well, that's rubbish. Like, that's nonsense. You know, that's BS. That's rubbish. Or another word for, like, nonsense or BS, oh, that's cod swallop. I don't believe that. That's cod swallop. Cod is a kind of fish. I'm not sure what swallop is. Cod swallop, oh, that's total nonsense. That's cod swallop. You can't tell me that you missed the exam because of traffic. It's but at three in the afternoon. There's no traffic. That's cod swallop. Okay. <laughs> Eight. Don't get your knickers in a twist. So knickers is a slang term in British for underwear. Um, um, especially I think women's underwear. So don't get your knickers in a twist. Like, oh, don't get upset or, you know, don't be so bothered. Don't get so angry or don't be so anxious or, or worried or upset. So don't get your knickers in a twist. Just calm down. It'll be all right. Don't, don't get your knickers in a twist. Uh, nine, I was gobsmacked. Like you were surprised, shocked, um, taken aback. I was gods, I was gobsmacked. Gob is um, kind of a, an older British expression for mouth. Uh, if you want to be really rude <laughs> in British, um, to say shut your mouth, is, don't say this unless you want to insult or offend somebody or if you really know the person very well. Shut your bleeding gob. Means, uh, shut your mouth. Shut your darn mouth. That's kind of rude, so probably don't say it. But gob smack. So smack is a hit. It was gob smacked. I mean like you were really surprised, really shocked. I was gob smacked. I couldn't believe she said that to the professor. Okay. Uh, Ten, don't get shouty with me. That's kind of like cheeky. Don't get shouty with me. Kind of like, um, God. <clears throat> okay. Um, number ten. Don't get shirty with me. This is very colloquial, very informal. Uh, uh, it's kind of like ill-tempered or annoyed. Like you're telling somebody to do something and they're acting annoyed or angry. It's like, don't get shirty with me. Don't act angry. Don't get angry with me. It's not my fault. I'm just telling you what the boss said. Don't get shirty with me. This is what the boss said. I'm kind of switch, shifting to some kind of regional British accent that's not normal. Um, Eleven, these are cute British expressions. Um, these describe somebody who is not all there mentally. Either they're not really all that intelligent or smart, they're kind of dumb, uh, or maybe they have some mental issues. Um, so something wrong with a person mentally in terms of their mental health or their intelligence. Um, like, oh, Prime Minister, he's, one pic he's a picnic short of a sandwich. He's a slice short of a loaf. So it's like a, a loaf of bread is not quite all there. There's a slice of bread missing. Or um, <laughs> um, something's missing. Uh, in American, we have, American English, we have similar expressions like our president. His elevator doesn't go to the top floor. Or um, he's one card short of a deck, like a deck of playing cards. Um, he's one card short of a deck. He's not playing with a full deck, our president. There's something wrong up there. He's not playing with a full deck, a deck of cards. Twelve, a spanner is a wrench, a tool. So 
throwing a, a wrench into the gears, into the works of a machine, will of course jam it up, make it break it, and make it stop working. He's throwing a spanner into the works. We had all these plans set, and he's throwing a spanner into the works. He's messed up our plans, and he suddenly says he has to, you know, um, leave early. <coughs> okay. Um, Thirteen. I'll ring you. So it's not like this ring. Um, ring is to telephone somebody in British English, uh, or I'll give you a, give you a ring. It doesn't mean like this. It doesn't mean oh he's going to propose uh, marriage to you. No, he's going to give you a phone call. Okay, I'll I'll ring you. I'll give you a ring. Uh, something kind of similar I should mention here. Don't uh, have it here. Um, I'll give you a call. In American English, is like a phone call. I'll give you a call. Now, in British, uh, of course, they would. I think they would understand that. But in British English, it can also mean um, to pay somebody a visit. I'll give you a call around four o'clock. So in British, maybe more formal British, that may mean visiting their house. Uh, but I think maybe nowadays, more commonly, it's a phone call. Fourteen. And Bob's your uncle. Now this is an interesting, interesting expression. I'd say um, I, I came over and I fixed your bookshelf. It was actually pretty easy. And I said, okay, and Bob's your uncle, meaning that was easy. Uh, piece of cake, maybe in uh, an American idiom, piece of cake is easy as pie. Oh, no. So after you do something for somebody and it was something easy, um, Say, oh, and Bob's your uncle. Or if you're telling somebody how to do something, we do this and this and this, and Bob's your uncle. And that's it. Or, or and I, I, if somebody does something for you, and you know, like you might say in American English, oh, there you go, and there you have it. Or, and Bob's your uncle. Uh, meaning, like, that was easy. There, there you go. Okay, I've just done something or told you how to do something, and it's, it's easy, and Bob's your uncle. Um, where does it come from? Uh, it comes from a, uh, it's believed to be named after a British Prime Minister in the 1800s, whose name was Robert or Bob Cecil. And one time he appointed his nephew to a government position, an important government position. And so, and of course that's nepotism, which is now illegal, most anywhere. Um, but like his nephew got a job because, well, you got that job really easily because Bob's your uncle. And so that expression, British, British expression probably came from that. And Bob's your uncle. You got a job and Bob's your uncle because, you know, your uncle's a prime minister. That was easy. Easy job, huh? <clears throat> you look smart. Um, maybe an American would say, you look nice. Um, British, you look smart. Like you're dressed very nicely. He's wearing a new three-piece suit and tie. Very nice dress suit. Looks really sharp. Oh, you look really sharp. You're going for a job interview today, huh? Mm, you look very nice. Okay, very good looking. That's smart. And of course, he's so thick. I think we did this before. Kind of dumb or stupid. He's really thick. All right. <clears throat> so. Hopefully, this will help you now to watch Doctor Who and um, British TV shows. Uh, they produce some really good British comedies, British version of The Office. I've never had time to watch any of that stuff, though. Um, some good crime dramas. If you like crime dramas with sort of a psychological twist, I would highly recommend um, two crime dramas. They're kind of a, a, a series, um, Life on Mars and Ashes to Ashes. It's a crime drama with a really interesting psychological sort of sci-fi, science fiction-y twist. But anyway, um, so hopefully you can understand British if you hear, listen to BBC. BBC News is actually pretty good. And when you maybe um, go to maybe academic meetings or business meetings, uh, business dealings with people from other countries, countries where they have, they're either, they either speak Commonwealth English um, like people from Australia, New Zealand, England, or they studied Commonwealth, they studied British English in school and their English is very influenced by that. So Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, as well as other countries where they study English as a foreign language, but they mainly study British English. So like the Middle East, for example. 
Uh, this is common um, stuff that is helpful to know. So uh, I'll try to maybe put some of this on a website, uh, a page on my website later and let you know. Uh, so that is it for now. So have a good weekend and I will see you later. Cheers.